Hi, everybody. I'm author CJ Hunt, and we are here today with Shauna Pennington Baird, who is one of the voices of River's End. So we are exploring the secret fun behind the scenes world of audiobooks and how they get made and uh, meeting some of the people who are behind the voices of the characters that you love as well. So thank you so much, Shauna, for taking time out of your day to come and visit with us. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. And um, maybe just to give us a little bit of background about yourself, if you can, and uh, let us know how you came to be part of the narrating audiobook world. Sure. So um, my background is theater. So I did musical theater for a great many years. Uh, I have a mom who's a librarian, a dad who was a writer, so I love books. Uh, and about, about a decade ago, I quit doing a lot of theater because I have a kid and wanted to be home with my, stu with my child. And a friend of mine said, you should build a home studio and you should start doing voiceover. And the very first gig I landed was a nine-hour book. And that was like a week into learning voiceover. So I have been doing books for quite a long time, most of them pretty long. Uh, and some of them are long series and they can be anything from fantasy to romance. Uh, and I still do theater, but for the most part, I spend all my time in a quiet room talking to myself, whether it's audiobooks or it's promo or it's commercial or, or animation. Uh, and then I also run a studio called the Seattle Voice Academy where we teach people how to do voiceover, including audiobook narration. So we have two studios here as well. So I've got microphones everywhere, home here, all over the place. So nice. Um, and this might have been I as trick or treat is a teeny tiny little book. It's sort of a, a book snack that goes out on the website. So the upside is that every single person who wanders over to the website can actually hear that one and can have a listen and see what audiobooks are all about. So we're using it a little bit just to try and convert some people who maybe weren't audiobook lovers in the past or aren't familiar with listening to a story over to uh, devoted fans, which is where we'd like to see them. So that has been really fun, just getting to know some of the people who are doing that for us. Um, one of the questions that comes up is, how do you prepare to do an audiobook? Like, what are the steps taking it from a story on the page to something that's living and breathing? Yeah, I think the first step is you have to read the book. <laughs> um, and you have to read it for fun. So the first time through a book, we always say you go through the book about five times if you're an audiobook narrator, uh, at least five times to the book. But the first time you read for fun, just to get a feeling for what the book's about, what does the author want to get, want to say, what, where's the passion. Then the second time through, I like to do one on a tablet because then I start marking every character name and then I start marking the description of any of the characters from the author and any pronunciation questions I have, anything that might, might be a typo, might not be a typo, I can't tell. So I mark all of that in a tablet. So that's twice through the book. Then I email those off to the author and then I create a character sample for really big books that have 50, 50, 60 characters. I'll do the main characters, all 30 or 40 of them, send that off. Uh, all the pronunciation questions get sent off and then we come back and read the book. And that's not in one sitting. Pretty, pretty often it's gonna be one chapter at a time or maybe three chapters in an evening. And that'll take Depending on the length of the book, it can be a couple of hours, like one or three hours, or if it's a long book, it can be 30 hours. Most narrators are two to one, meaning it takes twice as long to read it out loud <laughs> as it does to read it when you're looking. Because every time we make a mistake, we have to stop and either do something called punch and roll, where we punch in, you hear the last 30 seconds you just said, and mm -hmm. then you come in. Uh, and then the fourth time through is to listen for mistakes and problems with the manuscript right there. And then the fifth time through is to make sure that everything's timed perfectly. So <laughs> All right. we save every single file. So you can imagine we have a raw file and then we have an edited file and then we have a mastered file. So every chapter has between three and five files each. We save all of it. So yeah. in like three places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Backup, 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 backup. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so how do you handle, you know, deciding what voices you're going to do for male f characters, particularly as a female narrator? That's something that um, yeah. seems to be a hot button issue is do, do the low voice, do you not? How does that work? Well, well, there's what's called voice differentiation. The big thing is we always want to know who's talking. That's very important. And for audiobooks, audiobooks are different than animation where we do crazy, wacky things. We don't want to do that in an audiobook. It's very subtle, just a little bit. 
So while we don't, we want to know who's talking, we don't want it to go so far that it's extreme. So when it comes to male versus female, I, I use pitch differentiation, but not males are not low and women are not high, but we do pitch. So like one would be down here, one by two, by three, by four, by five being my normal voice, by six, by seven, by eight, by nine, by 10, and 10 would be too high for most audiobooks. That's the animation. But I can have a character who's a guy who's like a number six. He's right above my voice and I can have a woman who's a two. So that's how I, I use pitch, but it's, I, I never, like men who put women up here or men are always down here, it doesn't, doesn't work. So instead I look for who is the character overall. If they're nervous, they might be pitched slightly higher or if they're younger, they're gonna be pitched higher. If they are, most women tend a little bit more smoothness. And so most women have a little more, we call it glide. Men, some men tend to take up more space. And so I don't think about it as being deep. I just think about taking up more space in the room and a little more resonance in the chest. So I think you can almost say they like masticate, they chew on the words a little bit more. So someone who's like really masculine, I might have them do a, like for some of the romance books, a little bit more in the chest. So, but again, not going too far. Cause as soon as we go to strain, it doesn't work. And as soon as we're pushing, it doesn't work. And I've had pl plenty, of plenty of women characters that were way down here for a whole book. So, and then the narrator's always my voice because that's a lot less work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice yeah. Narrator at five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, check the authenticity box there. Yeah. Is, you know, <laughs> yeah. Much like I think writing, you, you try to keep the voice as close to your own in that sense of whatever is your unique thing as well. Like that's the cool part that makes it you and not anybody else is because, yeah. you know, it's highlighting sort of your natural space. Um, so when it's a series and you have, because you've mentioned you've worked on some really long series, how do you keep that consistency from book to book to book and from character to character? I create a character chart. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, character charts in Excel. And so I have every character's name and then I have their pitch number. Like I just said that, so I can always dial in the pitch and then I will put in whether they have a lot of glide in there, their voices, or if they're kind of choppy and really nervous, I have, you know, they, 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 they dab a lot cause they're really nervous. So I'll have that reference. And then I will also put some character in my life or that I've seen on TV, somebody that reminds me of that character, they get put in the next box. That way I have an instant reference. So, so I know that I'm going to, my friend, my friend Clark is in like every book I do because Clark talks like this and I don't have to think about it. I just think of Clark and there's Clark. So, or, or, or my friend Donna Ray Davidson, she always talks like this. And so she's a little over the top. So I'd have to back her off a little bit. She's crazy. And so all I have to do is write down Donna Ray and I'm like, got it. <laughs> and that way, and I also never, ever ignore little characters. It could be the girl with blue hair. She makes the list because I've discovered that in book four, she has a major role. So if I can't remember what the girl with the blue hair looks like, I'm in trouble. Or Shakira the wolf, that happened. Um, if she's in book five, I have to see, okay, she was a four with some roughness. Oh, that's, oh, that's right, she sounded like Melanie, got it. And so that's how I remember three months later what choices I made. Nice. Huge spreadsheet. <laughs> and the spreadsheet yeah. gets, sh gets shared with the author so they can see it too. Very cool. Uh, and I know we, as an author with Find A Way, you fill out uh, a decently detailed descriptor that's supposed to list every character and any accents and, yeah. you know, distinguishing characteristics, all that kind of stuff. So is there any advice you would have for authors out there who are thinking of working with a narrator as far as your prep or what you should that, track? Or well, you sent me was heavenly. Yeah. I've never had that before. That was great. Because I did, I had photos of them. I, you did all the work for me. I was like, oh, there it is. Okay, it was four characters too. So um, that was great. The more uh, an image is very important. And the more you can give them a cultural touchstone, like I was talking about, say it sounds like um, Seinfeld, the guy from Seinfeld who's crazy, who always has that, that, that crazy sound. If we put right. that there, or sounds like Bob Hope, you know, age that way, you know, that's like, oh, got it, Bob Hope, I got it. So if you have a, and also if you want the author to make a change, that's why the more you can communicate narrator to author as they're beginning those characters, there won't be changes later. Because I've done where I've sent in a, a, a series of, of, of choices and the author goes, Oh no, no, mama May's tiny. She's really little. And I'd made her this right. really big person. So we could e instantly change it. And so she got to hear that sample and go, Oh, let's fix this. Mm -hmm. And that way there aren't any changes later. It's all, everyone's on the same page when you start. Yeah. 
Yeah. Excellent. Um, have you ever narrated ghosts before? Like how do you make a ghost sound versus, uh, versus a person who's corporally present will say since there are, there's a projection and a ghost in, um, trick or treat. And then there's also characters who are physically there. So yeah, I, was, I, don't. I was curious if that has come up in, in other situations or if that was a, I think those are my first ghosts and I've done some really weird stuff. I mean, like I've got tiger people and shark people and, and uh, I've had a lot of vampires. I'm trying to think of any <laughs> ghosts. I think your book is the only ghost. And I just treated them like normal people was the choice yeah. I made. actually. Yeah, um, for sure. But I think if it were someone that was extremely translucent, there could be an ethereal breathy quality, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's an over the top fantasy type book which I don't, yeah. I don't, this one was so much more in that real world. Yeah, yeah. In the it's, world, it's fun, but it's in the real world. So maybe some ethereal stuff, but again, less is more. Because mm -hmm. if we were to go to, it's already too far, which is great for animation, but animation yeah. did go a little too far. Like a, even a kid's book, it's good to go kind of in the middle, never all the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, think I, like stage acting versus oh, TV film acting. camera acting. Like if you're going to be in film versus stage, like you have to really do it if you're on stage because it's got to go all the way right. up to the audience whereas the camera's like whoo in your face and the microphone is right there and you're in yeah. someone's ears so we equate voiceover with film it needs yeah. to be nice and subtle and nice and then and our microphones in our booths hear everything we're thinking so we can never go into the booth in a bad mood or we have to re-record the chapter <laughs> because it's <laughs> hear anything so we have to go in and we have to put ourselves in your book and we have to be living it the entire time and the minute something happens, like I have a tickle in my throat or a scratch, we have to stop. Go mm -hmm. out, deal with it, take care of it, come back in, and then get back inside that world. Yeah. In my case, everything. <laughs> so how long does it take to pro like for you to get an app? Like I think, and Trick or Treat is not even an hour. So how long does it take of extra time to get to that finished, say, hour of a story? Okay, so for Trick or Treat, it took about, it took about half hour, hour, hour to read, prepare, uh, be ready and then a little bit of warm up. So typically before you go in, it's about five or 10 minutes of warming up just to make sure articulators are working, make sure that we're not scratchy. And then we record it, which can take, again, it's two to one typically. And then editing. So the editing process takes longer. <laughs> so that's three to one. So trick or treat took about three and a half hours to edit. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was about five and a half, six hours. Wow. Yeah, so, which is, you know, great. That's I was like, phew, because when you look at an 11 hour book, you go, ooh, yeah. holy cow. 11 hour book yeah. is eight hours to prep. And then it's about 16 hours to record, give or take an hour or two, depending on difficulty of language. And then another 27 to 33 hours to edit. So mm -hmm. oftentimes we will outsource the editing at yeah. a certain level. Uh, some new, new narrators for sure do all their own editing. I do about half of mine and I outsource the other half. Yeah. Nice. And I think that's really important for people to understand what goes into actually making it because, you know, one of the common complaints you hear is like, oh, audiobooks are so expensive. But when you think about the amount of time, like the author had to write that and then it had to get edited. Usually it goes through at least three rounds of editing before you even publish the book in the first place. Mm -hmm. Then you switch over to the audio professionals. And so then you've got voice actor time and studio time and, you know, all of these other pieces. It's, phenomenal that you can get one of those, you know, to 20 hours of entertainment for $25 or whatever it is. It's that shockingly, it's shockingly, you know, cheap, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting thing when you get that peek behind the door. I think you understand more of what goes into making it. Um, not to mention all the training that you guys go through uh, mm -hmm. in order to actually be able to do that so well. And it's really fun as an author to hear it come to life and to actually have those characters have voices is very cool. Um, what makes it fun to you as, as getting into that story and reading it, what about the story helps make it a good audio book? Cause there's really, it's different what works on the page versus mm -hmm. out loud. I think for me, it's doing theater for myself in a padded room. Um, and it's, it, the trick is to be absolutely true to what's happening in the scene at all times. And you're playing everybody, including the narrator who has an opinion always. So whether it's first person or not, the narrator always has an opinion. And there's always what we call subtext in acting. All, and, and in writing, it's more like foreshadowing. Our voices have to do all that foreshadowing as well. 
So what makes it exciting and fun for me is once I know where the author's going in a scene, my job is to just help. A really good narrator gets out of the way. You shouldn't notice a narrator. He's like, oh, this person's reading it, and then not think about that person again this, until this book was narrated by. Because we just want to keep, if the, if the author was writing a scene with tension, we have to let that tension come through at just the right time. And so yeah. what's exciting is getting to be all the people. And I would never get to play bad guys. It wouldn't, I mean, as a kid, as, as a younger girl, I was always the ingenue. So to get to play these crazy, you know, wonderful men, that's really fun because we'd never get to do that. Or to get to play little tiny kids or, you know, uh, unusual things. But it's interesting because you have to balance in a scene potentially the thoughts, emotions, and, what, and wants and desires of four or five people. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what's fun. And to do it just enough. It's like this very, very thin line. Because if you go yeah. too far, then the audience doesn't feel it because you're feeling it for them. But if you don't do it enough, then they don't, have, they don't feel it. So it's like, especially in scenes that are, are hard or scenes that have sexual tension are really fun because you have to play that just perfect. Scenes where characters die... Oh, I, I normally have to walk out of, out of the studio, especially like when you get to like book four or five and they kill off your favorite character. Oh, you get there and you're like, and then it's, it's, it's crying, of course, and then your voice gets all messed up because you're crying. It's taken me sometimes two and three times through a chapter where somebody I love dies because, again, you have to feel it, but then pull back so that yeah. the audience yeah. gets to feel it, not you. So that's a careful balance. Yeah, yeah. no it's kidding. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's fun. Like, I think as an author, that's winning. If you can make somebody cry from your book, you're uh -huh. winning. <laughs> it's that level of emotional intensity. You have to be attached to the character. I've gone back in and gone, I can do it now. I can do it. Nope. <laughs> 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 and so that makes a fun question. So do you have any sort of blooper highlights that you want to share? Um, oh, there's just many. We don't, we don't tell people how many mistakes we make. Oh, sometimes there are books I've done where I didn't get through a, a sentence without making a mistake for like a whole page. And the trick for us is for you never to hear it. I mean, so there's, yeah, I mean, the, the hardest thing is making sure that you get the words out really well, with all that stuff and hard sentences. So what'll happen is you'll start a sentence and not realize where you need to breathe in the middle of it. So oftentimes we'll get in there and be like, and this happened, da 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 and oh, and you'll hear us go, oh, no, you got it. What? How long is that? Oh, okay. And then we have the course hit stop, <laughs> back it up. So that, you know, and we do something called um, punch and roll it means it, it records over destructive recording. It records over what we just said, which is the, wait, what? Or my other favorite ones are, wait, who's talking? <laughs> I'll have the wrong accent because <laughs> I'll start the paragraph you know, with the French accent and they get a little bit in and go, oh, that's not you talking. Ah, stop. <laughs> and that's yeah. pretty common. To, or my other favorite is when you read the line, it'll be like, and she'll say, well, I thought it was you. She said angrily, <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that wasn't angry. <laughs> so oftentimes if I don't have the descriptor before the line, I will have to go yeah. back and do those sometimes. Yeah. That's not uncommon. Yeah. I mean, the people who read a book perfect – there may be narrators out there that have a perfect reading. And if I'm in the, in the, if I'm in the studio working at Microsoft, I aim for very low error rates because the, the, everyone's listening to you live and it's high pressure to do a lot in 20 minutes. Audiobooks, oh no, I'll take a run of seven on a sentence to get it perfect. Like if I think I could do it better, we do it again. Right. And I don't work with an engineer. I stop myself, set it up again and go again. Um, but I'll take a run of seven if that's what's required. And then I didn't talk about pickups. Pickups are maybe a month later, they'll send you the corrections. And the art of the perfect pickup, that's a lot of work because you listen back for exactly where you were in the scene and punch in seamlessly. So they mm. don't hear, and which also means we never ever move the mic. So if we're doing audiobooks, no one's allowed in my studio downstairs in my house if there's a book happening until the book is published. Because they yeah. go, oh, we have to re-record this. And I can't have the mic moved. Or I'd sound different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's tricky. And I know one of the questions that people always ask is, how many times do you have to practice before you can get it perfect? And it's like, mm, let's not, I mean, yes, part of that. But there's also all of this editorial magic that happens, which is, I think, where that idea of, well, you, you read it from start to finish in a chapter and then that, that's how long it takes to make it, you know, it, it's not, it's, that's, that's magic. That's like thinking... I just type out a book that comes out exactly the way you read it on the page. 
which yeah. is not really what happens. <laughs> and there are narrators who really practice before they narrate. There are. I will tell you in longer books, in your book was wonderful because it was just easy, easy, easy. In the really long books I've done, I will, if they're super, super tricky language, I'll just kind of remind myself how it's tricky. Our job is to be very good on the spot. So we've read the book. It could have been two weeks ago, which means I don't remember which words came when. So we are very, very focused in the moment right then. So it's kind of crazy. I wouldn't call it cold reading, but I call it barely warm reading. But it has to be exceptionally good. So a really great narrator is very good at remembering what was coming or what, you know, what happened, but staying right on the page in that moment on that sentence. We can't move too quickly forward and we have to be in the moment. So, so when we make mistakes, we just do it again <laughs> and again, <laughs> again, if needed. So. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to chat with us about all of these fun things. I would love to send people to find you. Uh, where where would people connect with you out in the world if they were There's curious? A couple places. Um, Shauna Pennington Baird.com is my email address. That's my narrator voiceover uh, website. But you can also find me through the Seattle Voice Academy. I'm the director here. So it's pretty easy to find me. We teach a lot of intro to audiobook and we work with authors who want to read their own stuff. So cool. learning how to do that and learning how not to panic. <laughs> and, and so many things are now done in home studios. The world is flat. So it doesn't really matter where you live anymore. As long as you have access to Wi-Fi and a quiet room uh, that doesn't have a lot of bounce, then you're able to record very inexpensively nice. with this. So. Excellent. Yeah. There you go. Well, for now, I'm having an awful lot of fun working with professionals and uh, <laughs> letting that all come to life on its own. But um, I know there are authors out there, especially nonfiction authors who would like to narrate their own stuff. So it's really great to know that there is somewhere that you can go and learn how to do that properly because you do want to do it right. It's a mm -hmm. pretty competitive market out there. Yeah. And we always want to have the best thing we possibly can for the readers. So thank you so much for bringing Trick or Treat to life. And and uh, that's a, a fun thing to share with everybody who comes and discovers River's End. And I look forward to working with you again in the future. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Bye, everybody. We'll see you around River's End. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of this Creative Academy event. If you're not a member yet, join us today and unlock a wealth of resources, masterclasses, feedback opportunities, and online community events designed to help you reach the next step in your writing journey. No matter what stage you're at, we've got a helping hand to guide you along the way. Check out our free resource room if you'd like to get a taste of how we can help you reach your writing and publishing goals. Thank you for bringing us along on your writing and publishing journey, and Donna, Eileen, and I hope we'll see you around the Creative Academy soon.